to tell you about a, a, a portable uh, breadboard box that I made. I was um, I was going to hardware meetings, um, packing the uh, breadboard literally in a cardboard box inside a rucksack um, because of uh, using a folding bike to to get to meetings, and, and evidently things got a bit uh, squashed. And this is um, what I replaced it with. So that's that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, the uh, the idea is um, to avoid as much sort of setup and, and tear down when when traveling and, and things getting mislaid, um, but also to have. Um, a, a box so that prototypes can be sort of placed in situ and tried out for a bit. Uh, you can't really leave a, an open breadboard on a living room shelf so easily if you've got uh, a busy house. Um, so first idea was to try uh, throwing in everything, a bit like M5 stack do. They have um, all of those peripherals you see in the bottom uh, drawing. Um, and of course, you'd need uh, interfaces. They, you've got the screen and three buttons there, but you'd also want uh, some um, linear uh, inputs and, and so on. Um, and uh, I, I kind of tried something similar. I, I made is this working? Come on. I made uh, a small box with a, a, a micro bit in it and brought out the microbit connections onto a header. And uh, here it is um, doing its thing on the handlebars um, and uh, used it as a, an oscilloscope to, uh, to to debug back to the old breadboard. Um, the scope would show that sort of thing and had unexpected uses. This is a, a brand new potentiometer, which looked fine on a meter, but you can see turning it, it a very poor contact. So that was all right as far as it was limited to not having um, breadboarding scope other than the, uh, the header inside the very cramped box. I had a look at what else people had done. This is um, a delightful Arduino Uno. The only problem is that to, to travel with that, you'd have to um, tear down your, your breadboarding. Um, Adafruit do this bento box, um, and it doesn't, to my idea, uh, supply a great deal. You've still got to put all your I.O. on the breadboard and run out of space. Um, price is an issue, too. That's uh, bring your own Arduino, the price. Um, this one's my favorite that uh, somebody's made with um, I.O. on the front and plenty of uh, space for breadboarding. So I got the bits together, um, did some uh, measuring up to see how these things would fit. And this is what I ended up uh, needing to, to, to cram together. It's worth having a look at the very center of the open box space. There's a pale gray rectangular sensor in there. Um, that's flat. And uh, when you drop that, it can take a long time to find it again. <laughs> so what I chose was um, a thing called a soft pot, which you may have come across. Uh, these are sold as, um, as potentiometers with a self-adhesive backing. And uh, you have the, the um, strip right across the top as the uh, center terminal, and then a conductive strip underneath it with contacts at each end. So you'd think that this thing would, um, would just emulate a normal potentiometer. You, you push on it in the middle, and the, uh, the, the, the top strip makes contact with the resistive strip on the base. Um, and that, that's fine, uh, but you can do more. And I've been using um, post-it notes as repositionable uh, cutouts in order to jiggle around 
around and fit everything on the box. Um, so that's how it uh, was uh, going together. The um, breadboard in the middle of the lid. Um, that's a, a pie board on the left. And uh, on the right is a, a 20 by 4 LCD display. Um, that fits in the lid loosely so that you can turn it over and, and see it through the lid or, or use the other way up. On the Pi board, um, that's power wiring and it's, it's all doubled. So um, there are two pins going into the breadboard for, for every voltage because um, breadboard contacts are not the most reliable. And uh, at the other end, uh, I've soldered it to the um, pin header on the pie board. Um, and that's that's because if you if you lose a ground, you can easily end up with five volts on a three volt input. The the pie board's quite good that way. Um, it's three point three volts, but it's five volt tolerant, except for the um, accelerometer on the board, uh, which means that your I two C has to only run at three point three. So there you can see the um, soldering direct onto the pins there. And uh, this was uh, the uh, this was the inputs. So they consist of the soft pot and that force sensing resistor, which I pointed out earlier as being easy to lose and hard to find. So that's just the components to uh, uh, to make a sens sensible sensing circuit out of that. And here it is all together um, uh, in use. So you can use it like this uh, with the, the box closed and you've got access to the, the sensors, um, the, the inputs in other words on the, on the right hand side. Um, open up and uh, you've still got access to the inputs on the, the left of the lid now when you flip the display over. Um, so that's, this is, um, this is the, the soft pot. So I had my finger on the soft pot and was uh, sliding it across to the left. Uh, obviously I've got a little bit more to do on my um, my sums here because as I go across to the left the the uh, width of my uh, contact my finger is making is, is diminishing when in fact I was pressing equally hard all the time um, but that's that's the interesting thing about the soft part I reckon is that you can uh, measure separately the the resistive track um, from the left pin to the contact point and from the right pin to the contact point and they don't always add up to the whole track uh, because the the um, the common contact um, makes contact over a, a certain width and so you can measure that width and that's what I'm plotting there um, and because fingers are soft that means you can do pressure sensing um, you can you can get a, a rough, very very approximate idea of um, how hard somebody's uh, pressing. Um, just looking. For... Uh, okay. Um, Made. And um, this is uh, the um, the uh, event loop where it says while true, and the um, the setup above it um, for that. This is the bare bones of it. Um, in the event loop, you've got a synchronize for the next poll. I didn't want to um, uh, just keep on uh, buzzing around the event loop. I wanted the um, 
inputs to be sampled regularly so that if I want to process them um, further, then I won't necessarily get a, a, a rush of inputs if there's not much processing to be done, a rush of inputs that all look the same and then a change in the rate of input when there's heavy work to do that slows the loop down. So you, you just um, read the, uh, the soft plot and uh, print out the, the line you saw and then do a, an incremental garbage collect to finish off. So I don't know if there's some um, some Okay, so um, just a few notes really on on the um, features. Um, the, the, um, the, the soft part, obviously, because it uh, gives you more information than a, um, a basic potentiometer, and because you can randomly access it rather than having to slide like you would with a conventional potentiometer. Um, it means you can use it as a push button or a touch pad. Um, you can um, you can use it in, in several ways to emulate other sorts of input device. And the idea then here was to um, not have to have the box covered in um, knobs and switches uh, to be able to uh, work with it, but just to have the one device that through various software drivers could emulate a number of input devices. Um, you may have noticed earlier, I don't know, that uh, uh, one thing I did find was that the the polycarbonate of the lid um, split where I made a slot cut for the USB cable. And um, it, the, the, the split uh, goes directly back towards the molding injection point. So <laughs> it's, uh, well, that's quite thick. It's, it's actually a little bit brittle when you go putting sharp angled cuts into it. So I clearly needed a, a dab of epoxy there. Um, The, uh, some other goals with this was, was to make it quick and easy to use, hence integrating the, the lead rather than needing to take one and finding I'd forgotten it, and using elastic bands rather than uh, screws to close the, um, close the box case. So uh, I'll just take you back to... Yeah, but hopefully there were some groans that I couldn't hear because <laughs> what was I thinking? Breadboarding the um, the uh, input circuitry for the the sensors. Um, it's hideously unreliable. The hair fine component leads um, mean that there's not much grip that the breadboard has on on there, and you can see I've I've had to. Uh, make and shrink a number of fly leads to get to the breadboard. And frankly, there was as much work as if I just built it up on a, on a piece of PCB on a breadboard. Another lesson from the build um, was uh, to um, uh, sorry. Yeah, another thing I should have thought about was to update the Pi boards firmware and test the thing before soldering 56 pins on it. Um, it would be an awful shame to find that the latest um, 
firmware didn't work on on this one for some reason. This is actually a clone. They're priced at about uh, between 30 and 45 pounds, the, the Pi boards for the, the same version. Um, I got mine um, as one of the earliest on Kickstarter for, uh, for 30. Um, you can hunt around a bit, and, and this clone was on AliExpress and came to nine pounds with a, an introductory offer. Um, and another thing that's that had more more effects than I'd anticipated was that because I was trying to keep it portable and fit everything in a small case, um, the uh, the whole thing needed short wiring, and it just made it much more work to to solder, fiddling around with these bits of wire that were twenty millimeters long. Um, and it was another thing that that uh, arose from the tight space was that no matter how much I drew out diagrams beforehand, in practice it was never quite enough. You can see on the edge towards us here, there's the, the pale coloured soft pot along the edge and to the right of it a, a dark shadow, that's the, the FSR. And uh, there was um, there was uh, not enough space to uh, even put a resistor and a capacitor uh, in series in the leads with that as they went to um, uh, jumpers onto the pie board. And I ended up having to mount the um, orange capacitor in its own little socket on the right hand edge of the, the board, um, distri distributing the uh, components along the wiring. Um, when doing small projects like this, one of the key things I found is that uh, the solder wicks into the wires and stiffens them up and causes them to break when you move them. So to get around that, I uh, I, um, I sometimes solder the, the wires alongside the pins instead of onto the end. Here, here I'm soldering wires onto the end of a piece of header. Um, you can turn the wire around to face the other way and, and have the, uh, the header's um, soldering part and the, the wires running parallel to each other and then um, solder that, which means that if you're mounting something onto the inside of a case, uh, the wires then turn back to the sides of the case and don't get moved around as much and are less prone to breakage. Um, there's a, a little um, tip I find useful here on, on this uh, picture. Um, when you've got two wires to solder onto one terminal, um, I slip a, a sacrificial ring of heat shrink around them to keep them together. It makes them an awful lot easier to, to uh, get onto the terminal without them springing apart and then uh, don't, just don't forget to put your normal heat shrink sleeve on first. Um, so anyway the, the, the main thing I learned on this project was to simplify, I had a, an earlier version all drawn up and um, it became apparent it was just never going to fit. By simplifying everything um, and chucking out a lot, uh, I actually got around to uh, getting started on, on building it and um, was then able to add a few things back in. Um, another thing worth noting with these, these sorts of projects is to um, show you the um, Oops. and uh, here we've got all the powers um, going back to the corner of the whiteboard. Uh, and the same on the um, the uh, whiteboard. Um, the wiring, um, even if it gets a bit like the uh, the green wires there. 
and then take the shortest route out to the side so that effectively the the uh, the join between the, the breadboard and the pie board is is your your ground point. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned this. The uh, the split voltages can, can catch you out. Um, the display there is a, a 5 volt display. Um, it works on 3.3 volts uh, I2C drive, so I can drive it directly from the Pi board. Great, you might think, but the LCD has got pull ups on, and those pull up to 5 volts, of course. Um, fortunately, the Pi board is 5 volt uh, tolerant, but, uh, and this was on a different I2C bus from the accelerometer. Um, had I used the same bus, it would have blown it. So uh, it, it, there are all sorts of tricky things like that that catch me up. Um, any questions at all? I guess one key question is that uh, interested to see that you're using Pi board and it isn't a board that I'd ever actually considered. Um, I tended to go for things like ESP32s. Um, but one of the things that I found was using MicroPython on ESP32s wasn't particularly reliable. It would run for a day or two, but after that it would fall over. And I ended up going back to using C++. You're absolutely right. The ESP32 um, has some, some hardware features which MicroPython um, finds difficult to work around because it's a standardized um, virtual machine that, that is portable across many boards. There is a version called um, uh, Lobo MicroPython, L-O-B-O, and that's um, specifically adapted for ESP32s. As well as it being more reliable, it also exploits some of the things like um, the ESP32's um, uh, capacitive sensing ability. Um, things like that, that that aren't available universally across, or even commonly across a number of development boards, and so they don't appear in the standard MicroPython build. So, um, There's some quite good um, cases for the audio. Um, your sound's breaking up, Richard. What was that? <clears throat> Sorry, I was just saying that the, the Pi Zero, um, there's, a lot of, there's quite a few cases that include a breadboard uh, with them, the Pi Zero. I'll put a link into the chat, but they're, they're really quite good because they um, expose all your pins, but they also contain everything nice contained. They don't, it's not, not like yours where you can leave your circuit set up. At least that's a, <clears throat> it's a neat, um, neat way to keep your Pi Zero with a breadboard. I'll put, I'll put a link into the uh, chat. Yeah, that, that sounds cool. I particularly wanted um, a microcontroller and a MicroPython one at that because it lets me write a, a development framework, which is a bit more elaborate than, than what you see here. But, it's just sitting there ready to go and it's really very easy to to have an idea and, and put some some code together um, I, I did that uh, yesterday actually um, I was just wondering whether you, you've tried it in um, in real life like have you have you been traveling with it a lot does it hold together well no it's it's um 
it's only recently done and uh, needs a bit of uh, polishing. But um, but I did use it in the course of um, making this, which is um, that's a, a a speed controller for my electric bike. And uh, it was it was very useful to have the the um, the loop all set up with the um, input peripherals as well. Um, I prototyped the whole thing on the, the portable uh, breadboard, and then ported it across to the micro bit, which took well several minutes actually. <laughs> it was, it's um, it's very similar. It it runs a different version of micro Python, but uh, Similarities. Um, there's very little to change. Did you want me to um, uh, to say a few words on soldering technique? Yeah, yeah, that could be good. A few, 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 tech, few um, okay. building tips. Well, um, I think the the thing that uh, I find key is is that uh, it's not so much about getting the right temperature as um, about uh, wetting. Um, so if you've got a couple of billiard balls touching, um, they touch at a, a point contact and you aren't going to get heat transfer across that. It's the same with your soldering iron tip and, and the components you're soldering. So you, you put a very thin skin of uh, solder on the iron tip, bring it into contact, and capillary action draws the um, solder to form a, a bridge um, around the contact spot. And it's that ring of solder around it that uh, conducts the, the heat. So wetting is uh, key, and for that you, you need to um, overcome oxidation so that the surface tension gets the solder flowing. Um, so cleanliness is the, the other key thing I find. Uh, I don't use um, one of those uh, sort of brass um, scouring sponge uh, pad things. I use um, a, a wet uh, sponge, a water soaked sponge to clean off the soldering iron and because it's at a high temperature, it oxidizes very fast. So I clean off the soldering iron and then um, immediately give it a minute amount of solder, the thinnest of coatings, go to my component and the uh, uh, solder gets sucked onto the component because the, everything's clean and it, it, it wets well. Um, so it's a very, very brief touch is, is I find it works best for soldering, especially if you uh, if you're soldering something small. Um, and the the micro bit's half the size of a credit card, and those those um, contacts on the bottom there one and a quarter millimeter spacing. Um, so obviously the the um, flux is in, important. I do find that the resin cord solders vary, and getting a, a, a well-known brand is worth it and of course getting lead solder for DIY. Um, uh, I don't really think there's a great deal more to say. Um, the high temperature not only means that the solder oxidizes in a flash but it also makes the solder um, dissolve the copper of the soldering iron bit quite quickly. So your, your soldering arm bit is nickel coated, but once that wears through, it will eat a cavity into the copper like a tooth. If you want to reduce all of, of how fast this happens, every time you've made a joint, go to the go over your waste bin and shake off any remaining solder. You want the, the minimum quantity of solder left on that hot iron um, so that there's uh, um, so little solder that it it builds up a high concentration of copper really quickly um, when it dissolves a little and that 
slows down the following um, solution process. So you're constantly shaking solder off the iron, giving it a wipe on the wet sponge, and then back in the rack or using it. And of course, uh, switch the iron off um, as soon as you you can. Don't don't leave it sitting there on the bench in, in, in five minutes because it's really small tip. It'll it'll heat up really quickly. Um, another neat trick I saw was a picture of somebody who put a an elastic band around the handle of a pair of pliers and made themselves a component holding um, grip without needing to uh, get one of those elaborate uh, bench edge um, uh, third hands, which takes up useful space on the bench. And um, that's very nearly it. There's, there's one little bit of focus. There's one more tip I have for you. Keep your uh, workbench tidy. Obviously, that's important. Um, on the right hand edge, there is the blue soldering iron rest. And the reason the soldering iron's balanced right on the, the edge of the bench is because underneath the bench, I've got a fan well out of the way. Um, and it's blowing a draft up alongside the edge of the bench. So all the fumes get pulled away without taking up any valuable space. Um, so that's it really, I hope that was useful. Any other questions? I suppose another thing to say is, is that the idea of, of the purpose of the solder is, is basically to supplement conductivity and supplement physical support. Um, it's It only conducts about one-fifth as well as copper. See, um, for many applications, it doesn't matter if your conductivity is low uh, because your electronic parts are often high impedance. But what is the point of using up a lot of um, carefully crafted solder and, and creating tracks um, by dragging that around. for heavy stuff. Okay. Any other any questions? I'm a little intrigued about I'm one of the intrigued about one thing saying about uh, the soldering iron tip being nickel plated. Um, I wonder if you could um, clean the copper down and then nickel plate back onto it again using nickel object and electricity. More chemistry, isn't it? What looks like I guess it's going to need to clean it up, ready to. Uh, do that. Well, loads of nickel items in society, so getting nickel back onto a copper tip might be easy to do. Yeah, something I meant to mention is that because of the the way the um, the wetting is key. Uh, I myself a not a screwdriver blade, a screwdriver shaped tip. Area of always bring the solder close to the component. Your audio is really, really bad. Can't make out anything you're saying. Yeah, I think we have to end that one there. Audio's going too bad. Well, 
I had one other comment. Somebody told me that soldering iron tips, when you get them, actually come with iron on the copper, not just nickel. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, uh, something else occurred to me. They talked about the um, in a portable uh, bread breadboard scenario, uh, the, the cables and the soldering cables getting um, worn through 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 movement. Just thinking about it, would, would a ninety degree header? Um, help so that you could then potentially solder on and then um, cable tie or or, secure, or hot glue the cable to the circuit board rather than it standing out um, standing out on its own. which cable is that um you, you talked about uh sold carefully soldering on a cable that was protruding from a circuit board if you use a 90 degree header um, then the cable would be against the circuit board rather than standing proud. Okay, yeah. um, I got some angle for, for doing exactly what I um, It just coincidentally ended up I've not needed to use it yet. I think it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Unfortunate problems with your audio, but very interesting. Thank you.